people may not be familiar with Panini. Um, tell us a little bit about the organization. What is Panini? Okay. Panini, we are used to say internally that it's a 79 startup company, uh, 78 years old startup company, because we're doing really, we're going to do our 80th anniversary next year, actually. Uh, we have been founded by the founder is from Panini family, that is a famous Panini, a famous family in, um, in Turin, Italy. Uh, and uh, in, over the years, we have become basically one of the two leaders in the check scanning, check scanner business. So basically our primary customer are financial services and banks. And uh, thanks to our bestseller Vision X uh, that has been launched 30 years ago, we are still uh, a very important player in this, uh, in this space. I know. But uh, we have current, thanks to listening to our customer, we have decided basically to move in toward, towards this uh, space of identity. And this is the reason why we're here today at the Identity Week, now launching, announcing our business line, uh, launching a new solution, a new patented formula, to a new patented method to, to recognize, authenticate a uh, uh, person, uh, giving back directly to them their credential, biometric credential and personal information. And this method is called BioCred. And this basically is the reason why uh, we are uh, now approaching this space of the identity and verification. This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Not so bad yourself? Doing great. Here at Identity Week America 2024. Gotten to know our guest, Marta, over the last couple of days. Fantastic person. Really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, we've got a sponsor spotlight episode uh, for everyone today. Uh, these are special episodes that we develop in collaboration with our friends. And today we've got Panini. Uh, they're going to be walking us through some of the things that they're that they're ready to announce here. So just make it crystal clear, right? This is a sponsored episode. Uh, we are here at Identity Week America. And uh, we've gotten to know Marta from Panini. If you want to visit the website, it's panini.com, P-A-N-I-N-I.com. And so Marta, Marta Napo, Strategic Marketing and Business Development Director, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Hi to both of you. And I'm really excited to be here today. <laughs> well, it is definitely probably a career highlight to be on the Center podcast. So I totally understand that. Let's talk a little bit about your background, because typically we'll start with how did you get into identity? And I'd like to understand a little bit about, you know, your perception of that. I must say that I'm a newcomer here into this identity space because I spent uh, the majority of my career so far, 21 years, uh, or even more than 21 years in the automotive segment, uh, out of which six years was I spent uh, in financial services uh, uh, service for automotive business where uh, frauds uh, and uh, identity verification, risk assessment, all this kind of stuff uh, are really more and more important year over year. And then I, I, I basically spent one year uh, in uh, doing also some advisory for startups that are really playing in this space and as well in technological space and uh, cloud-based space. And then finally, uh, one year ago, I, a little bit less than one year ago, I landed to Panini in, uh, that is still based in my own city, Turin, Italy. So um, and here I am. Well, that's exciting. Welcome. Welcome to the Danny space. It's very warm waters. Come right in. <laughs> uh, people may not be familiar with Panini. Um, tell us a little bit about the organization. What is Panini? Okay. Panini, we are used to say internally that it's a 79 startup company. Uh, 78 years old startup company because we're doing really, we're going to do our 80th anniversary next year, actually. Uh, we have been founded by the founder is from Panini family, that is a famous Panini, a famous family in, um, in Turin, Italy. Uh, and uh, in over the years, we have become basically one of the two leaders in the check scanning, check scanner business. So basically our primary customer are financial services and banks. 
and uh, thanks to our best seller Vision X uh, that has been launched 30 years ago we are still uh, a very important player in this uh, in this space I know. but uh, we have current thanks to listening to our customer we have decided basically to move in toward, towards this uh, space of identity and this is the reason why we're here today at the identity week now launching announcing our business line uh, launching a new solution a new patented formula to a new patented method to, to recognize authenticate uh, uh, person uh, giving back directly to them their credential biometric credential and personal information and this method is called biocred and this basically is the reason why uh, we are uh, now approaching this space of the identity and verification so normally i would ask how did you come up with the name panini but it sounds like it's a family name. <laughs> yes, it is. So that answers that question. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Really, the, the, the first years of the company, uh, in the first years, the company was based only in Italy. Then, uh, due to the fact that we were serving eight out of the 12 major banks uh, in the US, we have decided to open a branch in Dayton, Ohio in 1998. And so we have a big presence in the US as well. Uh, so, and, and we are currently in reality a really global company because we are serving 14 countries, uh, in the world, but still the U S is our major, major, um, place. So no, major, um, of course, market. So, um, so, so I, I take it that in the check verification space, you're already doing a fair amount of identity and access management. So this is really enhancing some of the capabilities that you already had. To be honest, we are just launching the, the solution, our solution suite today. So we are now currently running some POC, some proof of, proof of concept with a, a couple of uh, organization, one in the bank industry space. So one of our customers that uh, really would like to apply our solution, not only for recognizing um, allowing their customer to have a frictionless and smooth experience in the access in, during the access of a, a brand, branch or at a teller station. Uh, but on the other end, we are having another POC in the healthcare uh, business in Italy because there are, I mean, we are uh, there are really obsessed by the time effectiveness of some operation. And uh, the way we are authenticating uh, the recurring uh, users, because it could be either for the doctor or for the patient, depending on the use case uh, um, we are dealing with, um, this could be really a, a good solution to that. So we have a couple of POC in place currently, and we hope uh, that uh, it could be it could open as uh, several doors, uh, also not just for these two verticals, but even for other verticals. It sounds like a kind of a core functionality that you're working on right now or that you're making yeah. available is the identity verification. Yeah. So I'd like to know kind of because identity verification, being that it's it's hot, it's also kind of new and taking form in terms of how vendors are approaching the market. How for Panini, how do you define identity verification? Uh, for us, there is there are two different moments basically. So the first, uh, um, first of all, we have we have found a space for us in the in presence so far in the in presence identity verification. So this is uh, because we have noticed that during the pandemic period, uh, a lot of investment have been fostered in the online. We were all forced to work remotely, mm -hmm. so we are being we are, and we are getting used to be recognized, be basically to access uh, thanks to our smartphone everywhere. Uh, so to be verified everywhere uh, in online, let me say online experience. And uh, while we uh, we have we have seen listening to our customer, there are still some. Uh, ineffective processes in ident identification of the customer because mostly the our customer the present for example at the teller station they are simply looking at the id or and the person that they have in front of us or maybe using a chip ap solution so basically the debit card the credit card and their pin to validate uh, the identity of the person they have in front 
while we have decided, we have, we have focused in, we have separated the two moments of, um, of the identification. So first of all, the moment of the enrollment, in which, of course, uh, that it takes a little bit, uh, you say, not much time, but a little bit more time than uh, uh, in the next phases. So where, uh, um, thanks to our solution, the, the organization could uh, basically enroll the person verifying an identity document could be either be an identity card, passport, mobile driving license, whatever, and then adding some biometry, uh, in our case, the fingerprints, uh, to, and encrypting everything in a QR code or an FC, an FC tag that we are giving back immediately to the customer. So as soon as the customer, the user, let me say customer, patient, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, whatever. Uh, as soon as the user had downloaded from the, from the app, um, from the app, they, uh, their QR code, they automatically, automatically, basically um, deleted from our server. So no one is storing any personal data, uh, either biometric data or personal data inside our, uh, inside our server. So this is for us, uh, let me say, the first phase of the authentication. And this, a, a, every time the person, the customer, the patient is coming back you know, to, the, to the organization, they just need to show the QR code and put one of the fingers they have selected in the enrollment phase, and they will be immediately matched and recognized and granted the access to whatever they have to go. Laboratories, labs, uh, hospitals, uh, uh, bank account uh, and this yeah. kind of thing. You mentioned something there that I thought was really interesting about not keeping the data on the server. And it kind of leads into the question that I was processing, right? Because being a company that was born in the European Union, focus on privacy seems to be heightened. And I think that almost shows that that is part of the focus. Am I, am I on something? No, you are totally right. You are totally right because uh, honestly, we are obsessed by preventing the privacy of our customers on one of the customers of our customers <laughs> and as well uh, of our employees because uh, being a European based company, GDPR has been enforced uh, uh, since uh, quite some time. So we are really, really, we are taking a, really, a lot of care of uh, not uh, of pr um, basically preventing the privacy of uh, the, especially of sensitive data, either they be biometric data or personal information data. Uh, and then, but I think that this kind of regulation is coming, is going to come into play in several other regions and following Asia as well. And there, there are some countries that are adopting this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, regulation. And uh, I was recently reading uh, a research uh, um, based upon the US uh, uh, Americans, basically, the uh, US people. And they will say that basically 78% are reluctant to provide their data, their personal data, uh, to an organization, but on the other end, 70% thinks that uh, it's, they will need something more secure than password to access, especially where there are big risks at stake, so to access uh, their bank account or their uh, uh, health uh, provider, insurance provider, and so on and so forth, uh, platform. So, I think that uh, this is becoming more and more important, not just in Europe, but really that's everywhere. What I, that's what I was going to say. I think there's a heightened concern with having biometric data being on a server and it being able to be potentially breached, just like any other data. And I think not just European, but also American and, you know, probably globally, people are becoming more cautious about giving their fingerprint or their face scan or anything like that in terms of being worried about what might happen to it. But the process that you're using really prevents that be from becoming an issue. I yes. think it's important because you, you can change a password. And as much <laughs> as I wish I could, I can't change my face. <laughs> right? So if my facial recognition data were to become public domain, 
that's no longer a viable biometric for me. It's now it's a fingerprint. And then, you know, what happens at that? They just don't. So I, I'm very curious to, to understand more about how that works. But I must say, it, um, as I was saying, as soon as you, as soon as the enrollment of the person finished and you download, yeah. you know, download the QR code you have received from your email, uh, everything was, is, um, is be, basically deleted from our server. And the only person that is keeping the, the credential is the person itself. So it's like kind of first step towards a decentralized identity. No? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, we know that this is coming, the centralized identity, self sovereign identity, and so on and so forth. So it's pretty much coming. Um, and so um, basically, the, the, the customer itself is keeping uh, uh, it with, with him. And uh, we just need to bring your QR code or your IFC tag and your finger. And the reason why we started from the finger, you mentioned the facial recognition. That for sure is something we are going to add inside the fish. It's in the road, in our roadmap, no? But we have preferred to start from the finger because it's currently more secure. Also due to we know that the AI is coming to play now in the, on all the deep, deep fake for the facial recognition and so mm -hmm. on. So we have decided to start from the fingerprint because we leverage we have leveraged our knowledge in treating uh, and transmitting uh, uh, image safely, the one that we have developed to transmit, to basically to scan and transmit, check, mm -hmm. uh, check images. And uh, so we did the same for the fingerprint. And thanks to this fact, basically our uh, fingerprint has been recognized as by FBI, FBI as one of the most secure and reliable. Uh, so. We know that fascial is going to play a big, big, uh, a big, a big important role, and we are going, for, of course, to the further develop. But we prefer to start uh, just to be again to prevent as much as possible uh, to reassure our customer as much as possible of the keeping secure and keeping reliable our solution and their data. And uh, the same it will be with the palm print and uh, contactless uh, technology that is coming. So, and smart. I think you're starting from a position where you already have knowledge and capability in that space. So, yeah, totally makes sense to to move from there. Um, I'm I'm curious from a, you know, I'm going to take the role of the jaded CISO or security person. Right, I see a lot of products in the space. What are some of the features or benefits that you see for your solution that sets you apart from others in the space? Apart from the one we have just discussed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, this is for sure the most important one. But then, uh, as I was saying, the reliability of our fingerprint, uh, the, mm, the fact that we would like to be a turnkey solution for uh, our, uh, mm. our customer. So basically, um, we would like to be an access point and trans point. We would like to be fully integrating in their workflow. No? I'm thinking, for example, the workflow to open a new bank account. Now we would like to be the entry point and then afterwards to be fully integrated. We have this capability then to the fact we are not, we are not a big organization. Was the reason why at the beginning I said we are a 79 years old startup company. We are not a big company. So we have the flexibility to, to adapt and customize uh, our solution in, into the workflow of our customer. And on the other end, uh, Due to the fact that we have moved all the feature of our solution into a cloud-based architecture, uh, it's very, it should be very easy for uh, the organization is going to adopt our solution, uh, even for not the bigger one, the, the biggest one, not, not the one that the uh, big uh, IT department. Uh, I think that it could be very easy uh, to man to basically. I'm not saying it's part, totally plug and play, but it should. <laughs> our, our aim is to be as much as possible uh, um, easy to be deployed and uh, also the maintenance. We can take care about the maintenance thanks to this cloud based uh, infrastructure and, uh, of course, uh, releasing uh, uh, the customer from some staging cost that in such kind of technologies could be a pain point for some organization. Do you find um, that your presence already in the check scanning area, 
I, I would assume that would lead you into, oh, here's the things we heard from customers that we're looking to adopt yeah. that. I would imagine aligning it as part of that onboarding process or whatever that looks like is probably, I don't want to say easy, but maybe simpler from mm -hmm. that approach. Is that fair? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Of course, uh, mm -hmm. we... Our primary customer are banks and insurances and financial services operators. So it was easier to listen to their need and to develop now and to develop something based upon our knowledge. So we start as um, an hardware, I must say, an hardware. I'm, I don't want to hide myself. We started as an hardware uh, manufacturing company because we were uh, producing. Uh, check scanner for them, even if some have already the capability to scan ID and to basically be connected in the back end with an IDV provider, so identity verification provider. But uh, we are announcing how our lineup uh, not to, um, to be to satisfy some of their need. And uh, and when we ended, we ended up with this solution, uh, now then the fact that we are now cloud-based uh, is a first step towards an hardware agnostic solution. Now, so that we are clear here, we are presenting both the hardware part, that is a tablet, secure tab, and the software part, uh, but our aim in the future is to become uh, less hardware-centric and more uh, uh, basically to move into, into the space of the identity, move towards an hardware analysis solution. And this could open up a lot of other verticals, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've been focusing this conversation on finance, but identification, identity verification is exploding all over the place. Government, uh, healthcare, like you mentioned, I can see, you know, use cases in education, right? All kinds Absolutely. of stuff out there. You mentioned you're launching this sort of today, right? We're at Identity Week America and, and you guys are on the show floor. What has been the initial sort of feedback as people, you know, as you get the message out there? You know, what are what are your thoughts on that? I think the feedback was uh, quite good. There were some uh, inter some re people genuinely interested in our solution. Uh, it was very important to be here, uh, first of all, to understand which are the questions, what they would like to know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they, uh, and they were surely interested in the into the fact that we are not keeping or storing their data anywhere. Uh, they have tested the, the, our, our solution and it was quite smooth. Uh, it was really smooth and quick. So they, they, no, they have been able to test. Uh, Makes a good first impression. Uh, yes, first impression. <laughs> And the other, the other question that we have received, honestly, was, uh, can I put this, all this feature into my device? So, it, and we were explaining that it's, uh, it's absolutely in the roadmap. We have, we have just launched the cloud-based infrastructure. So it is where we would like to go. Mm -hmm. It will t still take some months and some time, yes. uh, but it's, it should come. And, um, and the other point uh, was the one I, I briefly mentioned before, that is uh, the capability to add additional services into it. Uh, probably we haven't figured out either ourselves how many services we could potentially add to this platform. We have some in mind. So I was facial recognition, uh, um, contactless, uh, um, palm recognition, uh, uh, but I, I really think, I do think that there are other services that are potentially be embedded. So for, for example, we are now collecting signature in, with our, uh, with our device. There is uh, a partner we're dealing with in Italy, we're dealing with in Italy that is a governmental supplier that is really much interesting in, uh, um, making the signature, um, the advanced, Sign signature with the fingerprint. Mm. So basically to have uh, this, our fingerprint certified and recognized to, as uh, with the capability to sign uh, officially, formally, some important document. So this is something we are thinking of and we would like to develop. So in terms of even not just access management, but also contract life management and this mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I, I do think that there are many opportunities out there that uh, starting from the identity verification and the identity we can pursue. 
Is there anything that's been surprising from feedback you've gotten or just having announces now into the, you know, into the market space? Anything surprising jump out of you or is like, yeah, this is pretty much kind of what we expected. What are your thoughts there? <laughs> Uh, I'm not saying that it's surprising. I was, I think I was aware, I've read a lot about this, uh, this world. Uh, there is see, still some reluctancy to, to destroy, I don't know, to, uh, we need to lower the barrier. Mm -hmm. And in order to lower the barrier, we need to basically uh, start uh, um, pivoting and showing uh, successful cases. Uh, uh, and partnering with the right partner you know, to to rely as well on uh, uh, their uh, brand awareness and their uh, uh, say in this space, you know, because I think it's um, um, it, it is what we were we were discussing before. Uh, people don't know exactly where their data mm -hmm. are kept. The trust factor, right? Yeah, the trust factor. Yes, the trust factor. So I think uh, is uh, is growing re rapidly, definitely, because uh, uh, we have been here last uh, as an attendance. Uh, at the attendance, we were we have been here last year, and this year there are much more company providing such kind of services. Much much more company working. Uh, or in this space, so it's, it's growing really rapidly. In the healthcare, they are estimating a growth of uh, more than 16% uh, up until 2031. So I think there are really, um, yeah. uh, it's a growing, uh, th there is a growing interest, growing market, but there are still some uh, barrier to, uh, to be destroyed. And uh, Well, it's still a relatively new area. I, I feel like this is an area where you know, there's new solutions like yours in the market and people are still kind of figuring it out, right? And how to adopt this into yeah. those things. I think there's an untapped market too for um, really any organization where you have to do any sort of validation for who is on the other end of the phone, for example. And I think of a use case that Jim, you and I come up quite against uh, a, a lot is the help desk. You forgot your password and then now I've got to call somebody for support. What does the company help desk do? it's usually not a great solution to validate identity and the more options that we have available to be able to say, Oh, here's how I prove Marta is who she, who she is and not the deep fake Marta who is calling me trying to get her password. Solutions like that, I think would be really interesting for organizations to understand like, yeah, this is not just finance. This is not just government. Any organization where you have a human interaction with another person that has to validate in a certain assurance level or, trust level that you want to have and say, am I okay to provide this new password, this new credential, whatever it may be, this piece of data, I think there's a benefit there as well. It's true. I, I, I just, I can think about my previous professional experience in my previous company. I was working for a multinational company with uh, thousands of employees, so 68,000 of employees. And so small uh, company. Yeah, small company. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, how? Our badge, badges, there are some badges that allows you to run into some labs or uh, into some where there are uh, the engineering playing a role, new, ve new vehicles, new, no, new feature of the vehicles. And there are just some people allowed to enter in such spaces, in such rooms, in such labs, workshops, and so on and so forth. But really, if somebody has stolen my badge, could enter easily in that and discover maybe the new feature of the, the product that, has, that is going to be launched. While if I could put my, simply my finger or my eyes or my fa fa face, they won't be able to do it. Mm. So I really think that there is a, a space even for companies, as you mentioned, uh, uh, company hospitality in the hospitality so uh think about uh, uh like a room key maybe or access to uh, you know the the marriott lounge or things like that uh, right exactly <laughs> as a, a, a really a recurring customer for or, some the marriott close to our offices in dayton <laughs> and uh, it could be really really smooth uh, process if i can uh, quickly enter or quickly be enrolled uh, for my staying uh, so i fully fully agree that there are 
And schools, you mentioned before university, mm. college, and these kind of sp spaces where uh, there are a lot of people going back and forth. So many places where you need the physical access. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. when Jeff and I talk about the sponsor spotlight episodes, we a lot of times say, this is a, our audience's first opportunity to hear about a company, hear about your solutions, and kind of determine whether or not the solution solves a problem that they have. Um, so I think you've given a good overview of your solution, but I'd like to also ask it in this way, which is what are some of the use cases that if, if folks are listening or watching, they're having, yeah. you can, you can help them solve that problem. So maybe just come touch on two, three use cases that these are the people that should be contacting you. Absolutely, absolutely. There are uh, one very interested one is uh, uh, in the financial services uh, business. There is one bank we are dealing with uh, that would like to apply our solution for both for customer and employees, but more for the em their employees because they are experiencing some faults. Uh, uh, in accessing their, uh, basically the, the, their system, banking system. So, and if uh, they are able to put in place these multi-factors based upon biometric uh, um, recognition, verif authentication, verification of the person, they will be allowed to lower their insurance premium for the risk, the risk of their company. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, is a very interesting case uh, we are dealing with at the moment, uh, that I'm sure this is not the only financial service uh, provider that uh, uh, is dealing with. Another use case, uh, uh, and we have a couple of use cases as well in the healthcare business. So one is for uh, the uh, to access uh, to dispatch therapies, right therapies to the right patient. And, and again, uh, this is a two ways uh, authentication. So both for the patient to be sure that is the right patient that we are served. And uh, on the other side for the doctors and the nurse that has to access to the cabinet with the right therapy and so on and so forth. So this I think is another uh, important case. Um, wow. And the third one is, as I was saying before, there are uh, it seems that for the caregiver, for the caregivers, especially for the home care, no, the person that, uh, and this is a, a case we are dealing with in, uh, for an Asian country, um, where uh, um, our solution will allow the medical provider, the healthcare provider, to monitor not only that the person that is going to dispatch the therapy at home to a patient, not only to, um, to recognize, to certify that the patient is the right one and the therapy is the right one for him or for her, but as well to monitor the time of the activities. And currently, what I can tell you is that in all segments, we are my, in my company as well, but in all segments that we're dealing with, financial services, healthcare, car rental business, hospitality, they're all obsessed by the time effectiveness. So to really keep as much as possible uh, the, the process frictionless, smoothless, and uh, in, in, improve the customer experience on one end, but uh, reducing as much as possible the time of the activity of the operators of the users. So these, I think, are two or three use cases yeah. that we are dealing Those with at the great. moment. Those are great. Um, putting ideas in my head of how I can see that working. Now, if somebody is hearing that and saying, okay, well, that is a use case for me, how do they go about learning more about the solution? So, of course, we are <laughs> We are I'm here to, the to, to, <clears throat> to explain to whoever it is interested. Of course, there is our website uh, and uh, you can reach uh, any, uh, any of us out uh, uh, and we will be more than happy to provide. Uh, I'm going to put your LinkedIn profile in our show notes. 
so people can reach out to you directly Thank that you. way. Plus the website, <laughs> right? Yeah, definitely. Nice for sure. So I will receive a lot of <laughs> <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah. A lot of nice I messages. Will be, I would be glad to receive yeah, it. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, we are. We definitely we are prepared. Um, we are prepared to all uh, to provide answers. And also, as I was saying, being uh, not a huge company, we are also quite flexible uh, to listen to the need of the person the organization is contacting us and try to fine tune our solution into that world. In, into that world. So, so this is. Uh, Do you have some ideas on how? So, okay, I'm sold. I want to get this thing, but sometimes I have to make a justification to the company to say, I want to make this investment. What are some of the ways that you see your customers measuring the success? You mentioned one thing, which I think is really important is maybe a percent, a potentially savings on insurance premium for cybersecurity. I would imagine, you know, the, all of this is, might be harder to quantify things like, um, a, a better user experience, which can be quite subjective, but have you thought about some of the dimensions where somebody can say, oh, here are some of the ways that I can measure the success of this of this capability. Yes, so of course, what you mentioned is are totally uh, <laughs> some first points uh, of attention. So capability to lower, so economical reason not to lower, but as well uh, what we were discussing before the time the time that each activity is uh, no, especially if you have to log in and log out frequently from a system, uh, the time you're spending in doing it uh, could really. Uh, provide some savings to the organization, uh, savings or better customer experience that you can then measure with an NPS score and such kind of score. Now that the, especially the financial services are really key, no? <laughs> but um, uh, so for sure, uh, uh, customer experience, uh, time effectiveness, so time lapse of the of the various activities, lowering the insurance cost. Uh, um, and also being a cloud-based uh, um, infrastructure behind, uh, of course, this could be a reduction in the staging cost, uh, infrastructural cost, uh, needs for assistance, IT providers, consultancy, and so on and so forth, these kind of things. And um, last but not least, uh, that is uh, really the main, uh, the first point for which we have... <laughs> Basically, entering into this space, the number of frauds. Mm. So I That's think that's key. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Reduce yes. fraud. <laughs> reduce frauds. Absolutely. Reduce frauds uh, thanks to a high quality and reliable system and uh, solution. And, uh... Yeah, most things can be dollarized because companies are dealing with um, those kind of account takeovers and account um, uh, onboarding fraud. And so they have real numbers and if they can achieve a reduction because they're moving away from knowledge-based authentication or maybe you have a card and a pin, I mean, that's not really as strong as a fingerprint, which only one person has my fingerprint and it's me so far. <laughs> so don't, we're not going to cut your thumbs off right now. I, was, right. I, I wasn't sure if that's where you're going, but yeah. Well, it's exciting times. I think, you know, this is... For me, I love seeing new choices in the market because I think this drives innovation and it's an exciting time. So congratulations on getting out there and, you know, I would encourage people visit panini.com, you know, visit the website, get more information. This is a capability that every organization really should be considering how are we going to leverage this because it, it reduces risk. It can improve the user experience and both of those are critical to the success of any identity program, any yeah. security or risk program. So it's exciting times. Um, we were talking before we hit record here and we always like to end shows on a lighter note, you know, kind of have a little bit of fun towards the end. Um, you're the first volleyball teacher <laughs> that we've had on our show. So I'm fascinated. I want to understand more about this because I'm just a casual fan. I don't know about you, Jim. It's like, I see I see the events in, you know, we just had the Olympics. And so there was a lot of yeah. excitement around that. During the Olympics, I've become an expert. And now I forget it. And by That's the way, right. Italy in my country has won, uh, for, with a female uh, team, has won the Olympics. So, yeah. so, the so you can do a little bit of gloating and that's fine. <laughs> We're happy to do that. So congratulations to Italy. But tell me about, I guess, being a volleyball teacher. What does that mean? Take me through like a day. Are there things that like surprise you still about it? Or I, I don't know. I'm just fascinated. Teach me. 
I'm too short to be a volleyball player, so just <laughs> I get that already. <laughs> so I'm, um, I think I always I been playing volleyball since I, I was eight years old. My best friend, really, is the one I met uh, when I was nine years old playing volleyball still. So I think it has played a big part in my life because uh, it helps me to be, to have some discipline, mm -hmm. in to be able also to face um, having, so to be disciplined and uh, to um, be capable to bear some sacrifice to, in order to succeed. Um, and as well, uh, um, and as well, the fact that I was used to have competition when was when I was playing, so to put every time in front you in front of a, uh, the the need to to do a good performance, no, not just for you but for the entire team, has helped me a lot uh, uh, at the beginning as a player, then afterwards as a volleyball teacher. Uh, because uh, it's a team working, so it's a team, uh, no, it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's important uh, how do you, how you perform, but it's even more important how you perform inside the team. And this is basically and being capable to teach, uh, train, train. Uh, 12 teenagers at the same time uh, with completely different uh, um, mindset, uh, uh, interests, uh, uh, and uh, capabilities, uh, but being capable to uh, train them to work, to play effectively towards the same goal, uh, no? to achieve uh, uh, towards the same goal in a really in, with a cheap. Also with good mood, no? <laughs> it has teach me a lot, uh, even for my following professional life. I must say that I'm not more able and not capable now. I'm still keeping alive my patent, uh, being training twice per year with the most advanced technology and materials and so on and so forth. But I'm not capable now currently to, uh, to play volleyball and to teach volleyball. Uh, uh, because I'm traveling too much inside my, for my job. For, That's a tough uh, one to so. travel, to have a, like a, you know, people can run pretty much anywhere or walk or go to a weight room or things like that. Volleyball is a little bit different. You can't, <laughs> you can't really travel that. And it's not like there are, at least not in the U.S., there's not as many volleyball courts, yeah. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because, you know, Jim, you mentioned, it's like, we become an expert every four years, right, when it comes through. <laughs> um, and I see a lot of people... But you know, we have sand volleyball has gotten more popular, I think, mm -hmm. and it's a very approachable sport. And I see a lot of people. What's a tip that you can give to people out there to say, okay, the next time you go play volleyball, try this, and maybe they can see some success? Because I see a lot of people have different like modes that they'll try to like put their hands together to do like a a bump or something like that. But what's a tip that you can help me up my game with? I must say that. Mobility is what is all about. Mm. So I think you need to keep uh, not standing uh, really fixed uh, in your place. Uh, always look at the at your counterpart and the the ball, basically the ball, uh, keeping you moving uh, to be able to be really reactive. This is, I think, it's uh, so reactivity uh, is. Uh, I think it's. Uh, is playing a very important role uh, in the because you don't know where uh, exactly where the ball is going. You can imagine, and if you are ready, if you are ready, if you are capable to react immediately, and you will, will be the first. The first, of course, you have uh, an advantage. Uh, it's you. You need to be flexible, adaptable, and uh, and uh, this is a concept that is very much usual as well. It, well, it sounds other, simple. Other. It, it sounds simple, but it, it's not really, right? Because really the goal is to float within yeah. the space and cover the blank space. Because if you're working as part of a team, 
you need to be able to not cover the same place because it leaves more space. This is where the most ball, the majority of the balls falls mm -hmm. because uh, be because of accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is another very very you touch another very important point because when the ball is in between two players, uh, you need really to to be accountable and to to stay to um, to say loudly mm -hmm. to tell loudly that you are going to go. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to prevent, prevent uh, either to go both <laughs> or, or neither. <laughs> or neither. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I know Jimmy, a baseball, baseball guy, that's kind of like, you know, the fly ball. ball. I got <laughs> it. I got it. I got it. And <laughs> they, they run, run into each other, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I'm that crap the whole time. But go into YouTube and type in dogs playing volleyball. Okay. Now you got my interest. No. You will be blown away. So dogs, dogs playing volleyball. Yeah, yeah, there's, and especially there's one dog who I saw on TV this week. So one of the things I do is when I travel is I'll watch the local news and they had this big story on this dog and he hits the ball off of his nose and he's really good. I mean, I think what he does is tries to hit the ball back to whoever hit it to him. So it's like if you can get the ball, bounce it to him, he can set you up for a spike. I the mean, ultimate teammate. He's the ultimate <laughs> teammate. Yeah, he and he's I must see as happy as can be. <laughs> I must All right, see. so you need to send me that link so I can put it in our show. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, here's the thing. If you go into YouTube and type dog playing volleyball, there's tons of videos. Wow. <laughs> and I, I will send you one so we have one, but just know out there, YouTube, it's available to everybody, dog playing volleyball. <laughs> Not sure I'm ready for the, yeah. uh, <laughs> to teaching some dog, even mine, that on which I'm not so successful. So. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can. I have three dogs, and they don't fetch. They go and get the ball, and then now <laughs> it's their ball, and that's a pretty much where it ends. Exactly. Like, okay, well, I don't know how we're going to top uh, dogs playing volleyball. That's a good it's topic. Pretty impossible. Anyway, uh, Marta, thank you so much for taking time with us. Congratulations on the launch. Uh, we'll be Thank keeping you. an eye out for you. And uh, thanks for spending time here with us at Identity Week America. Thank you to you. We'll have links in our show notes. So visit the website, panini.com, P-A-N-I-N-I.com. We'll have a link to your LinkedIn profile so people can send messages there. And uh, yeah, for Jim and I, uh, we're at idacpodcast.com. Thanks everyone for watching and listening. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. You've been listening to Identity at the Center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com. See you next time on Identity at the Center.